call public plan commission meeting of September 13th, 2022 to order. Roll call, please. Bill here. Kipchinski here. Lark here. Kavich here. Zikowski here. Aldani here. Super here. Chandler here. And that will get us to the approval of the minutes of August 23rd, 2022. If everybody take a moment and take a look. If there's any errors, corrections, omissions, or discussion, uh, feel free to speak up or when you're satisfied, a motion. Secret moves to approve the minutes of August 23rd, 2022. Music calls to a second. Uh, roll call beginning with Crow. Crow Live. Shinsky I. Bark I. Kavich I. Music calls to I. Aldani I. Secret I. Chandler I. And that Mr. was oh, oh, come on in, Christine. We Mr. Chandler, I don't think your microphone is working. Is mine working? Chandler, I is it okay there? Okay. okay. Um please let the record state. Uh Commissioner um Hannah's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. That was just for the minutes, Christine. So I know I was running behind myself. I actually was late myself. Yeah, I know. Tell me about that. Okay. Uh, significant common council actions. Carrie? Council approved the following an ordinance approving the rezone of the properties at 9102, 9120, and 9140 South 27th Street from B4 Highway Business and RS2 single family residential to RD1 two family residential. Also approved a resolution approving a certified survey map submitted by Anil Yapuri for the properties at 9102, 9120, and 9140 South 27th Street. Uh, also denied an ordinance to rezone the property at 150 West Ryan Road from B3 Office of Professional Business to B4 Highway Business with no change to the FW floodway or FF flood foot fringe districts with a conditional use permit for vehicle sales wholesale. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, item five is Board of Housing and Zoning Appeal Actions. Uh, there were none the last month. And item six, the Quarterly Park and Recreation Commission's Actions. Uh, we will get that report on September 27th, 2022, which I believe is our next meeting. Correct. That will get us to item seven, which is just a discussion item. Uh, we'll be discussing the North Bluff Planning Study uh, with the consultants from Edgewood and Resources. So I'll ask Carrie to kind of bring us up to speed on that. So as some of you may know, uh, we have been engaged with consultants from Edgewater Resources to assist us with the North Bluff Planning Study. Uh, for those of you who are a little bit oriented toward the lakefront, uh, we are talking about an area that roughly stretches between Lake Vista Park and uh, the uh, MMSD plant. And what we are gonna be talking about tonight, uh, led by our consultants who are with us via Zoom, uh, we're gonna be talking about some of the conceptual images uh, that we've received from some feedback on from the public as well as from the Parks and Rec Commission last, last week actually. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over to our consultants. And if you could uh, just introduce yourselves whenever you are ready, and I will bring up the presentation. Yes, hi. So um, can everyone hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So hi, my name is Nick, I'm, my name is Nick Stefani. Um, I'm with Dennis Carmichael. Um, I am an engineer for Edgewater Resources. We have offices in St. Joe and Madison, Wisconsin. I've been working pretty heavily, very heavily and hand in hand with Susan Winnin, who's a city engineer for Oak Creek um, for about two years now, working on a permit to get this work uh, started. Um, I wanna give a brief intro on where we are, where we came from and how we got to this point via the permit because that is gonna really set the stage for the concepts and the designs that we came up with, which is gonna be led by Dennis Carmichael and Ben, Glenn, ben Gladstone as well. Um, so about uh, in 2010, the city acquired this site. It was a former industrial site, a lot of uh, impacted material. And the plan that was worked out through a lot of work with the city and the Wisconsin DNR was basically to place a clean cap over the top. And that basically means you're gonna place a, a one foot to two foot layers of soil above this material. 
Another important condition of that uh, uh, planning process was that wave protection at the at the toe of the bluff was required, meaning a robust revetment so that this thing doesn't unravel and doesn't further expose these impacted soils. With those constraints, the real only option that we had from a design standpoint and engineering standpoint was to extend the existing bluff at a three to one slope, which is geotechnically stable, into the lake. This is not a typical or even preferred permit path from the DNR and the Army Corps folks, but given the sensitive nature of the material inside the bluff, that was really the least impactful option that we have. And so basically our general design plan is that we're gonna extend that three to one slope down towards the lake, and then down at the toe, we're gonna to build a revetment similar in construction to what you guys have at Lake Vista. So that's gonna create the kind of the rough blueprint that we're working with. Um, if you wanna hit the next slide, please. Um, that's gonna create the rough blueprint, blueprint that leads to everything else that we discussed. So um, we're, we're gonna be constrained to that three to one and that footprint and that, and that sort, that, that stuff. So the first started uh, planning efforts um, that we began was on August 2nd at the National Night Out. Um, we basically had a board up here that kind of tried to separate and kind of begin the process of where we wanted to take the, the design, the aesthetic of this site. On the, on the left, you have something that's more active, fun and iconic. And on the right, you have something that's more passive, more enjoyable, so probably something closer in, in, in construction style to Lake Vista Park. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the summary of those options. Um, obviously it's pretty close down the middle, good vote for something active, fun and iconic, which typically comes with added cost, which obviously is something we wanted to consider and, and keep in mind in the back of our heads. Um, so we kind of had a kind of a split down uh, both options. So as you'll see from the options we started, we kind of start with a more passive approach and then kind of work our way to more intense or more active. And again, that's kind of added costs as well, which we're fully cognizant of. Next slide, please. In addition to that, we also kind of wanted people to, at the same night, place uh, marks and, and votes to what they wanted, the what sort of activities they wanted to include at this site and as part of this planning effort. Next slide, please. So these are results. Um, swimming, splashing near the water, it was obviously the, the highest preferred. Me, Dennis, Greg, and Ben uh, were able to walk the site um, from basically north all the way south to Bender, uh, Bender Park to kind of get a good appreciation of what sort of infrastructure and sort of facilities and activities are currently there. And we actually came across a good amount of um, swimming access with Bender Park and then a little bit also to north of the MMSD site. It's not nearly as uh, popular and there aren't many, many people there, but it's a very nice beach on the north side of MMSD. Uh, part of the challenge with this particular site is that we are fairly con constrained to our footprint that we're going to be able to use. And given the way that um, the site is laid out, there's not a lot of good opportunities to build a beach into the shoreline protection at this particular site. So where we're going with access to the water is a little bit different, and it's not going to be quite a traditional swimming beach, but we do want, we are going to kind of provide some options or some thoughts on how to construct this revetment in a way that you can still come and get close and touch the water. So other obviously things that we that we keyed on keyed in on were kayaking and, and uh, paddleboard, non-motorized stuff, uh, and then also um, different uh, different just being able to do this sort of different sort of uh, activities instead of passive entertainment. Next slide, please. So then here are a couple of images that we kind of are going to use to kind of lead this uh, this this further discussion and kind of talk about. So for example, in the top left, that's sort of the access that I was talking about. That's a revetment and a breakwater. That's sorry, that's a breakwater that was built to protect the um, Egg Harbor Marina up in Door County. And they had two areas where they select specifically selected armor stones that were cut in a certain way to create a terrace that would go down into the water. And then another key feature that we wanted to point out is the building in the top uh, middle image. That's a shelter and kind of a building that's been built into the bluff. Because we're building this bluff at a three to one, we're gonna have the opportunity to build some unique features into the bluff and kind of create some iconic uh, view, views. And then uh, sprinkled down at the bottom are just some images of some different on alternative playgrounds and, uh, and using different materials rather than just having a playground built into the bluff. These are kind of creating different opportunities to keep a certain 
uh, passive aesthetic while also having opportunities for kids to play and uh, romp around on different types of uh, materials. Next slide, please. Sorry, next, yeah, there you go. Okay, perfect. Um, so again, here's some other images kind of high looking, high, highlighting the same thing. You know, we, and as part of our study too, we're looking at linkages in terms of linking this particular North Bluff, this Peter Cooper site with the adjacent sites. So we're looking and exploring options and how we, we will connect to the MSD site and kind of wrapping around to the North Pier. There's a couple of challenges with that, um, with that option, but we're looking into it. And then also we're kind of looking at other options to upgrade the goat paths and the different paths that exist that connect this parcel to uh, Lake Vista and then further south to Bender Park. And so we're kind of trying to give some aesthetic and some, some what those options may look like. Um, one other uh, last image I want to point out is the image in the middle right. The, um, that's actually what we sometimes refer to as a perched beach. That's actually in Colorado. And so you don't necessarily associate Colorado with beaches. But uh, obviously, it's kind of a big playground. It's big sand. And there's actually a fountain that uh, pumps water. So you can actually mold sand and kind of still do all the traditional sand castle features and kind of fun stuff that kids like to do. We could um, build a feature similar to this um, up on top of the revetment behind it, out of the water, so that you would have a very similar feel to being at the beach, but not necessarily having a traditional beach, uh, just like you would have at Bender Park. Um, but you would have one in a similar feature at this particular site. Next slide, please. So at this point, I'm gonna pass it off to Dennis, who is uh, also there at this design shred that we had with the city. And he's gonna walk through some of these concepts and images that we put together. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Nick. Uh, can you all hear me? I hope. Yes, I think we're good. Okay, good. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, our team came to uh, Oak Creek last month, and we spent three days there walking the entire site from north to south, starting at the south and Bender Park, walking to the north, uh, to the north side of the water treatment plant. Uh, and, of course, if you go to the next slide... Yeah, the, the North Bluff project is kind of in the middle there. And one of our conclusions that we came to from our walk there was that we think not only is North Bluff a potential destination on the shore as a recreational asset, but it is a critical link into a longer uh, piece of connective walkways and for uh, bicycles and pedestrians from north to south. So we're quite excited about that. We think there's a lot of opportunity here to create more than just the sum of its parts, more than just this site and its potential use. So we, we spent, uh, again, I, as I said, three days and we worked in City Hall. And so most of the drawings we're going to show you tonight were created during that charrette. Uh, in City Hall. And, and I say that because they're very quick and they're loose and they're freehand. They're not very sophisticated. Um, and we wanted to present these to you in their unfiltered, unpolished version because we have four alternatives to share with you this evening. Um, and we also shared these with the Parks and Rec uh, folks last week. Uh, and we really are here to seek your input. So we will uh, create more polished, more finished graphics, but we thought it would be smarter and better for you to help guide us by showing you what I would call the raw, unfiltered drawings and the ideas that emanated out of that. So if you go to the next image, yeah, this shows the, the land use, uh, and, and you're quite aware that Lake Vista is a beautiful park that exists, and it has wonderful meadows and access down to the lake, as well as upland areas. It has what we, what we call a high road, which is a path at the top of the bluff, and it has some kind of, um, people have made these low road paths, and they're very narrow, by low road, I mean down near the lake, they're not paved. They're not, I don't think, official, but people have just sort of figured them out and worn them down. Um, and we applaud that. And we think that part of what we should be thinking about is creating more of these pathways, both on the high road, if you will, and the low road. So there's multiple options for people to traver traverse uh, at both elevations and within North Bluff, that there's plenty of places for people to go from high to low that are accessible. So that's part of what we learned by <coughs> those, uh, that walk uh, that, that week. Next image. 
Yeah, and here's an analysis that begins to show some of the land uses and the potential. So if you look carefully at the area of Lake Vista, we have rendered in the proposed residential uh, development there. Um, because we understand that is about to happen. It isn't there today, but it suggests the scale and the grain of that and the fact that lots of people will be living there. Uh, and it also suggests some pathways from where they live uh, into the, the green park of Lake Vista and also down um, to the bluff. And we, we and I, I might also add that the magenta color on the right is uh, an area that we believe is potentially uh, developable. Once the capping is done, we have been led to believe that that a similar kind of mixed use development could occur also on that site. So we've also uh, considered ways that uh, pathways and or roadways might go through and get to the North Bluff area, which is still surrounded by that red outline. One of the things that, that caught our attention was there is an existing road that goes down to the water intake plant. Uh, and it is a secured road and there's a gate up near Fifth Street and you cannot go through that gate unless you have a card, unless you're authorized. Um, and it occurred to us that maybe there might be an opportunity, um, again, without sacrificing security, that maybe there could be handicapped access parking down at the foot of that roadway down near the lake and or maybe bicycle access because it's a beautiful road. It goes all the way down to the foot of the uh, of the bluff and ends right near the park. We, we totally understand that security is paramount at the water intake. Um, so we, we cannot, and we know we cannot compromise that, but we propose this and in the charrette, um, uh, Doug and Susan said, it's not such a crazy idea, we will consider it. So we bring that to your attention as well as consideration. Again, we acknowledge that security is paramount. And if you all decide that you do not want to do that, even in a, uh, a very reduced kind of visitorship for only handicapped parking and bicycles, we would totally understand that. So the other thing that we're showing near that foot of where that roadway is, near the intake plant, is the idea of a bridge, a bridge that would cross from bluff top to bluff top. And if you've been down near, near that area, you know that those bluffs at that moment are about 70 feet above the lake. And there's a pair of them, the roadway sort of carves in between them. And what we heard from the stakeholders was, uh, among other things, they, they wanted to see both active and passive uses, but they also said, can you consider something that would be of a landmark visible from the lake? If you were out on a boat in the lake, um, is there something you might see at this location that would signify this is North Bluff? So one of our ideas here that we're going to share in a second is the idea of right there at that moment between the two bluffs, maybe we do a bridge that spans over that roadway that again goes from bluff top to bluff top and creates an accessible path that continues what again we are, we are calling for lack of a better phrase, the high road, a bluff top path. And you see that, that would go into a red circle, which we mean from a planning point of view is an activity zone and then continues on with a yellow uh, line and arrow uh, to a new proposed uh, bluff top path. What we're also suggesting diagrammatically in this uh, plan here is the low road is the blue lines. And, you're, and you, what you see here is at the top of the revetment, which will be at the toe of the, the new slope, there should be a path there. We believe that could connect to a path that already exists around the water treatment plant. That area is not completely connected today. You can access it from the north, as we did. Uh, there's a parking lot off Fifth Street. You can drive down there, you can park, you can walk down. And there's uh, a wonderful path around the water treatment plant uh, that is quite secure. There's a wall and a landscape buffer. Uh, but at a certain moment, as you're walking south along there, uh, it comes to a, a complete halt. So one of the questions we're asking here, and we're asking for your guidance, is could we continue that walkway completely around the water treatment plant and then connect to the toe of North Bluff so that that blue line that we're showing here could become continuous? And in fact, if you, if you are following my logic here, if you go back to the, uh, the blue star, that's again another activity zone. What we're also proposing is a lakeside trail 
that would be at the toe of the bluff of Lake Vista as well. And in that case, that path might need to be uh, actually over the lake, outside the toe of that slope, again, for security reasons, so that it does not touch the water intake building, but it creates a wonderful boardwalk uh, kind of experience out over the lake. And when we say over the lake, we mean maybe 20 or 30 feet outboard of the existing toe of slope. So it's not way out there, but again, it's all about connectivity. And we think that this project could become a nexus for con connectivity for bicycles and pedestrians. So next image. Thank you. And um, yeah, and th this shows that idea of that bridge. And this is the idea, what, what the idea is showing here is maybe it becomes the landmark because by definition, it's gonna be 70 feet tall. And what we're showing here is the notion of something that's incredibly graceful uh, and lightweight and is pedestrian only, bikes and peds only. It's narrow enough that vehicles cannot drive on it. And maybe it's a suspension bridge. So maybe it has that wonderful feeling of a little bit of swaying in the breeze. Uh, and becomes a wonderful way to traverse from uh, Lake Top Bluff to Lake Top Bluff, north to south. Like in this sketch, Lake Vista is on the left and North Bluff is on the right. And then some images of similar kinds of bridges are at the bottom of this screen. So that's one idea. Uh, next image. Yeah, and now we're gonna share with you some of our uh, options. We have four to share with you, two that are more passive, two that are more active. So the first one, if you go to the next image, is quite simply, um, well, this includes the bridge. So quite simply, if you went from Lake Vista and you cross that bridge, you can see it in plan view, and you get to an area that's at the top of the North Bluff. Maybe there's a roadway that goes through the canal parcel uh, all the way down from Fifth Street uh, and creates a small parking area at the top of the bluff. We're also indicating here uh, a small handicapped only parking area at the toe of the slope down to the north, <laughs> the immediate north of the water intake building. And then a series of pathways that uh, will traverse both up and down the slopes um, and a series of little uh, docks or jetties that would go out over the lake uh, as fishing piers. So this is probably the most passive, the least um, invasive, if you will. Uh, it's really all about bikes and peds, maybe mountain bikes. There is the notion in this plan of a building that you would enter on its roof from the parking lot, and then underneath it would be a picnic shelter. And if you go to the next image, yeah, this shows that in section. So on the right-hand side of this drawing, you see the parking lot, you see a little slope, you see a pathway, you see people standing on what amounts to the roof of this earth-sheltered building. And so think of it as a picnic shelter. It's not anything more than that, uh, but it is protected from the wind, protected from the sun, and it helps pick up the grade uh, with retaining walls on its um, upper side. And then we're showing conceptually here the notion of a series of very natural climbing elements. So the fun of this particular uh, um, zone and the activity is really climbing, climbing up, climbing down over rocks that we can salvage, over uh, timbers that we might salvage from the uh, some of the trees that have to get removed in the uh, creation of the new bluff. And then you see the pathway at the toe of the slope on the new proposed revetment. Next image. Yeah, and this, this one is a slightly more active version of that same idea with maybe a little bit more rock climbing, uh, a slightly bigger shelter building, but there's still parking on the top, a little bit of handicap parking on the bottom, and then a series of pathways that sort of wend their way up and down the slope. And what you'll notice here in the, the pattern of the plans is there's no straight lines. One of the things that we're thinking of is that all of our, our uh, interventions here should look as if they're shaped by wind and water, because that's really the two elements, the two natural forces that shape this. And we're, we're, we're kind of looking at a clean slate here. This is gonna be a very clean, pristine three to one slope. So we have the opportunity to kind of sculpt it. It's almost like being an artist 
but earth is your medium. So that's what we're proposing, to have these very delicate, beautiful, graceful um, pathways that ascend up and descend down. Um, and many of them will be the accessible path as well. And you can also see there's a hierarchy of paths. Some of them will be wide, some of them will be narrow. But all of them will be uh, intermingled with meadows, uh, very similar to what has been done at Lake Vista. We love what has been done there. Uh, the meadows are beautiful. Uh, they're ecologically functional. Uh, and we want to, and they're also very low maintenance. So we want to, we want to uh, emulate that and extend that language of landscape with very little turf that actually has to get mowed. Um, most of it is going to be meadows. Next image. Yeah, this shows a section through that. And again, a slightly more um, active area with more steep climbing walls. Uh, again, climbing materials that would be native rocks and stones stacked up. In some cases, as you see in the right-hand side, they can also be purchased for sitting. So the idea is uh, lots of fun, lots of activity concentrated at this one area and using as many natural materials uh, as we can. Next image. Yeah, this next image gets a little bit more uh, in the category of active because of the stakeholders were pretty much even in saying, yeah, we want some active stuff and yeah, we want some passive stuff. So this shows again, a concentrated active area. In the center of this, you see a V-shaped area and that is an, a very active area. It's a tree grove with, that is um, functionally like an amphitheater. It's a series of stepped stones um, and what we're proposing is we flank the edges of that with slides. So you could run up it, but you could slide down. And we think that would be an amazing amount of fun. Again, keep in mind, this is about a 70 foot bluff. So imagine sliding down 70 feet. Uh, we think that would really be uh, unique in the region and fabulous and lots of fun. And at the toe of the slope, we're, we're proposing uh, what Nick had alluded to earlier, a perched beach. And think of it really as a sandbox that has water attached to it. Uh, if we go to the next image, yeah, th this shows what it looks like in section. It is higher than the lake. If you look at, at the section at the bottom, you see the lake on the left, you see the revetment, which is eight feet higher than the lake and the perch sand is higher than the lake. So it is not connected to the lake. It is not a sand beach at all in the true sense. It's kind of a giant sandbox. But by having a water source there, we can get all of the, the, the what I would call the good clean fun of a beach without the seaweed, without the, you know, the nuisances of sometimes there's fish there that float up on, on the beach. It's, it's just a giant sandbox that allows kids to make their sandcastles and play. It allows sunbathers to sunbathe, uh, but it is disconnected from the lake itself. So your connection to the lake will really be as you walk in the revetment. You will still have stunning views of the lake and you will still feel like you're a part of it. But in this part of the park, um, we are not proposing a true beach because we think that function uh, is already well served uh, at Bender Park, which is about a mile to the south. And then you can see also the, uh, the very regular uh, series of steps in the section on the right-hand side and the grove of trees. And if you look at the next, next slide, yeah, th this is a sketch of what that looks like. So you can see those steps that go up. It's a shady place for people to sit, but also you see those slides coming down. So that's the fun way to go down. So we think kids will love to run up the slope because they'll love to slide down the slides. And you can see this notion of the perched beach uh, where people can set up their chairs and the kids can play on the sand. Uh, and it's a wonderful family activity zone. Next image. Yeah, and this is our, our fourth alternative and it shows uh, even more intense activity. Uh, what, one of the things that we heard from the public and the stakeholder review is we would love to see some fishing piers. So what this one is saying is, what if we did a fishing pier that goes out over the lake, but curves back in? So it's not a dead end the way most fishing piers are, but it still provides that sense of getting out over the lake uh, and allowing for fishing. So you see that, that sort of parabolic shape that goes out over the lake beyond the revetment. And then you see a contained 
water area between the revetment uh, and a walkway. And we'll show you what, what that looks like in a second here. But that is not a part of the lake. That is um, a wading pool. It's a very shallow pool. It is, it is perched in the same manner that the sand beach is perched. It is not connected to the lake. So it is. it would be chlorinated water. And we'll show you what that looks like in a second. And we also had the, the notion here because people wanted to have a landmark. We said, what if instead of the bridge, the landmark is a tower? So if you go to the next image, yeah, so here is that tower. If you look on the right hand side of the, of the slide, you see that there's the parking area and you would walk out at the same level as the top of the bluff, and then you would be 70 feet above the lake because you're at that same level. And then you would there would be a stair tower that you could climb down if you chose to, to get down to uh, the water's edge. But we think that could be a, uh, a wonderful landmark, obviously very visible, but we acknowledge this is gonna cost more money. So in a certain way, these four alternatives go not only from more passive to more active, but they also go from probably the least expensive to the most expensive in all honesty. So, and then you see the, the, uh, the perched, uh, what I would call a wading pool that is in between the revetment and the walkway. And if you go to the next image, yeah, so th this shows what all those things look like when you put them all together. So you see the slope, you see the, the deck that goes out 70 feet above to an overlook, and then a, a stair tower going down to it. You see the walkway, and again, that perched wading pool. Um, again, we're, we're thinking of this as being four to six inches, so we don't get into the need for lifeguards. Uh, it would have to be potable water. It would have to be chlorinated. It would have to be a managed controlled water source it's so it's not lake water so we don't want to uh, we don't want to pretend that it is we want you to understand that there would be maintenance required for this but this would again uh, address the the stakeholders holders request for touchable water so that's what this would do so again so here we have offered you three uh, I'm sorry four different alternatives we do not have a preference um, our goal here is to show you the range. Uh, and then to hear your guidance and your input, uh, much as we heard last week from the Parks and Rec Board. And so with that, we'll take your comments and questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, I've had the privilege of seeing these before, so I'm gonna <clears throat> let the commission speak on it first, and um, I'll just consider it open before anybody would like to go. It's like Christine's ready. Yes. Is it on? Yeah, here. So actually, I have a couple of concerns here, and you touched on one of them, which is a maintenance cost. So you mentioned that there is a, a high maintenance cost versus lower one, depending on the alternative we're looking at. But what does this maintenance include? It's just to remove snow during the winter, it's just to keep the grass, or what is exactly including? So I'm going to be setting all my questions and concerns, and then I'll let you answer all of them. Number two is um, safety. I see the kids in this image in front of us, the kids are climbing up and down those rocks. So, and it's a little bit on a slope. So what are the safety measures of some of those kids, depending on their age, fall or falling and hitting their heads on that, on these rocks? So that's another concern. I know that because my kids would do that. Another one is handicap accessibility. I don't see any elevator. I don't see anything for handicapped to access these activities, which is a huge concern for me. And lastly, again, is the winter. We live in Wisconsin, a lot of snow, a lot of uh, uh, flooding, whatever that uh, winter would bring to us or that uh, different um, seasons, I should say. So I don't know how is this going to be addressed with maintenance or just to not removing the snow the location of the snow piling, um, cleaning, make sure that this cleaning doesn't um, be located in one spot. It's also gonna take some cleaning or some of this uh, water, and this is uh, uh, flooding through those um, levels or uh, slopes, will potentially have any hazard waste to the lake. How is this being captured? Not to uh, be flooded to the lake. 
So again, these are all my questions and concerns. Yeah, Dennis, I can start and then you can tag team for any okay, sure. you see I missed. So just off the bat, um, if it was not explicitly stated, all of these options are gonna have ADA options and access to various points. All of the trails that you see on these various options that are thicker, those are all gonna be graded to be ADA compliant. Some of the smaller trails in between may be steeper or maybe set up for um, like Mike, uh, Mike mountain biking. So obviously those paths won't be ADA accessible, but you'd have a similar feel to what's at Lake Vista. So if you've been to Lake Vista, you'll see that you have long flat slopes. We're gonna try and limit the amount of Razorbacks to create a different feel, but the intention is to create ADA access to the main points of activity along the bottom and along the top of the bluff. So that's that's one thing. That's probably the easiest question to address. In terms of maintenance- No, actually I have a comment on this. When you say it's ADA compliant, you're talking like something uh, like curb ramps or something from that accessibility. And this is on flat surfaces, but something on a slope when it's you're pushing like a, a wheelchair for you to go down a slab and a uh, slab and then slope and then slab, um, that doesn't make to make it safe. So if I'm looking at the exhibit that you had at the last slide and you're showing that accessibility or like the slope, still steep slope for that to show. Like if I example, I wanna address this, I will put an elevator somewhere or they can go in and take the elevator all the way down. Again, I don't think having ADA compliant slab on a slope is safe. It's mostly the ADA compliant for curb ramps, not for a slope steep like this one. Yeah, you, you raise the excellent points. And, and I would suggest that we could, in fact, put an elevator in this tower. If you all decided, yeah, we're really excited about the idea of a tower, but we want to make the tower itself accessible. Yeah, the elevator is the way to go. However, that does increase the maintenance because as we know, elevators do go down periodically. So again, what Nick is saying is there will be accessible paths that will be less than 5%. That is the ADA maximum without um, ramps and guardrails um, and level landings. It's just a regular slope. Um, and we will, and there's plenty of room to do that. So we will do that under any circumstance, but you were, you're raising an excellent point about the actual tower itself. So we could in fact add an elevator if you all decided that this was the, the, the alternative that you wanted to pursue. So- uh, you, Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna answer your, your other question about safety. Um, and yeah, we are- Sorry to keep bugging you, but um, maybe I'm still not convinced with the, so I just mentioned the elevator as, a, as an alternative. And I know how costly that is, not just for the installation, but the maintenance cost as well, especially during the winter season, not just do the summer and spring season. So it's also a cost to add to those curb ramps, I'm sorry, not curb ramps, the level and slope curbs for it to be ADA compliant. And also there is a strain. So if I am a person pushing down a wheelchair, I will have to have some strength for me to go through that slope and then stand on a flat surface and go again through the slope. I have not ever seen anything from that example. So I think it would be a good idea to show us that similar uh, example you are proposing to us. Yes, fair enough. And, and again, you're raising an excellent point. That was part of the reason why we thought maybe we would have some handicap accessible parking spaces at the toe of the slope, uh, at the end of that road that goes down to the water intake building. Because everything you're saying is is 100% correct. And, and we do want to make it as comfortable for uh, the accessibility. But again, I will assure you that pathways that are less than 5% are ADA compliant. Um, they do require, it's, it is strenuous, I'm not gonna lie, um, but it doesn't require the handrails or the level landings, only at the places where they, they switch back. So we, we understand that, we respect that, and anything we would ever propose here uh, is going to meet ADA. Okay, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, I'll show you how they think. Other concepts. I'm just kind of picking you off one at a time. So when you're ready, let me know. <laughs> I think it looks great. I mean, a lot of great ideas, great <laughs> concepts, great opportunity. I mean, it's kind of nice variety of um, of options that they've provided. So. Keep in mind, these are conceptual. It's not like there's any one plan. It's a mix and match to whatever our needs and our budget may be. So, um, I don't know, Fred, what you think? Yeah, not too bad. I just have a question about the wave action down at the beach. Are we going to put in some kind of um, break wall or so forth to go in front of that area? All, all of these concepts, if you look down by the water's edge, there's that gray ribbon. That's going to be a fully robust revetment that will be able to handle all the wave and ice action uh, that, that, we'll be, that we would expect at this particular site. Those, that wave action can cause a lot of damage and create a problem down there. So unless you can control that wave action, you're going to have problems. 100%. Yep. And we've we've done some engineering analysis required to submit a permit to WDNR and the uh, Army Corps already. So we've sized the armor stone. We're looking at a one to two, a two to three ton armor stone, two layer stone revetment that would be typically designed by the Army Corps. Um, so we, we, we feel pretty confident that the that the toe of this bluff will be sufficiently protected from wave action and ice action of Lake Michigan. Other question I have is the terracing on the hillside to come down. Uh, how do you plan to hold that slope so that it doesn't erode? So, well, super, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, I might just say that we have very few areas and they're concentrated where we would have those stepped areas and climbing areas and they would need to be retaining walls and they would no, need to go down into the three to one slope. Um, and and our, our goal would be to have those be at uh, increments of maybe 18 inches to three feet high each. So it's a series of individual low retaining walls um, and, the, and the footings go down to frost. So yeah, the, that entire assembly needs to work and it needs to stabilize the slope and in fact, not destabilize it. But as Nick has said earlier, a three to one slope, um, while it looks steep, uh, is mowable. Um, it, is, uh, it is the angle of repose of, of earth, which means it's not going to erode once it is vegetated. So in all of the areas where we don't have um, hard construction, the meadows themselves, the roots of the trees and the meadows, will actually hold the earth and stabilize it. I think you've got a big challenge there on that slope. You seem unconvinced. <laughs> I, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're analyzing the slope. Three to one is a very common approach to uh, restabilize all, all sorts of slope, slopes and embankments with different types of incoming material. Right now, the city is importing a bunch of material to cap the top of that bluff. And a lot of that material is going to end up being used for this regrading effort to get to that three to one. And so we're monitoring it to make sure that it's going to be a suitable material that can be compacted and, and, and properly engineered for a slope, similar to a land a landfill embankment or a landfill slope or any type of uh, earth embankment that would be used for a highway uh, project. In terms of the retaining walls, um, Dennis is right. You know, we there's a variety of ways to stabilize them, whether it be through a gravity retaining wall or anchoring them. That gets to be a little bit more robust and probably what's needed, but we'll we'll be designing this to accommodate any sorts of loads to make sure that this is stable in the in the long term. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Fred brought up a good point. The main point of doing this is to stabilize that bluff. We have problems on the North Bluff, and you know we. I think we all realize we've capped the top and there is some polluted, some polluted soil under there. The last thing we want that is going into the lake. And that's why we engage them to create this slope, cut it back, vegetate it or whatever it needs to do uh, to prevent it. But Fred is right. You know, the, the water is going to constantly wear. And that's why we have these engineer groups looking at these different concepts to hold that back. 
um, and stop the erosion of the bluff. When we acquired the property, we thought it'd be a longer time period, but with rising lake levels and all of different stuff we've seen in the last 10 years, um, it accelerated the, the deterioration of that bluff greater than we thought. So here we are. So, but good, very good point, Fred. Um, anyone else, Vaughn, you ready? Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of the Lake uh, Vista Park discussion. And so I'm kind of familiar with um, kind of what we did with the uh, ADA and the switchbacks. Um, there's a, and, and believe it or not, I usually go for the more expensive version, but I kind of like this other version better with the slides. Um, I think that would be really interesting to be able to stop, you know, to be at the top and to see the steps go down. Um, I don't really see any place though for like event areas. Um, I, I, I believe to the West is a lot more parking, which was one of the things that we've always been criticized that there's not enough parking in the park. Um, and then bathrooms. Um, so event areas, rental options, or, or where would the bathrooms be in this, in this laying the layout of B1? Well, th those are, are good questions. We, we didn't include bathrooms because we know that that is incredibly expensive and incredibly maintenance intensive. But if you wanted them, they would likely be best located at the top of the bluff near the parking. Uh, and that we, we would have to get access through the canal parcel to do that. So uh, that may, it may not be an early action item, but it's something that we can certainly plan for. So sure, we can we can accommodate that. I, I think part of our our thinking here is we did not want this to become such a regional attraction that there would be thousands of people here, maybe only hundreds of people here once in a blue moon. So, but help us with that. Help us make that decision because we do want to make sure that whatever infrastructure we provide matches your intention for how many people you want to come here. Because some of the feedback we've gotten to is in terms of event space, you know, event spaces are very great, but they require people to manage those events, get those events, have them in common and, and solicit those events. And sometimes that is or is not desirable, depending on the, you know, the level of, you know, desire. Yeah, I would just love to see a place or, or in the future, a place where a band could play where you'd bring a lawn chair, you know, something where we could gather. Um, but I, I really think if people are going into the sand or parents with children, um, I see it at the Drexel Town Square, at the splash pad. I mean, those bathrooms are used constantly just to even change the kids. So maybe it's not running water, but it's a, it's a shelter of something. Um, but I think that's going to be really important. Uh, Greg? <clears throat> um, I guess of the the different concepts, I lean towards the the B B one B two. Of course, they're the more expensive ones. Um, I do like a combination of the two. Um, not necessarily the tower. Um, I don't. I think that's kind of a, a little much. Um, but I do like the stairs and the the amphitheater look. Um, I'll echo comments that that Don just made. Um, not necessarily looking for a, a permanent stage or anything like that, but if there's a way to lay out some of the, um, some of the stones in one of the example pictures, the flatter stones, um, something like that towards the bottom of the, the stairs that was described as, as kind of an amphitheater look, um, just for a potential band to set up, not necessarily a, a major event space, but just an area that could in the future be used to set up some live music or something of that. I know that entertainment was the second, the second most voted on um, item with the first item being swimming and splashing. I do see a, a sticky note on the, um, the one photo that says city pool. I don't know if that was distinguished um swimming splashing meaning in the lake or in an actual chlorinated public pool um i do like both the the small area of sand um but i also like the 
the kind of closed off area with uh with some water in it um if chlor chlorinated water was the only option I, I don't know that that would be um the best choice or the the number one choice um is it chlorinated because are there rules against um i guess pumping in lake water if there's pumps for chlorinated water can there be circulating pumps to circulate natural water from the lake or is there safety issues are there rules against that you know get dnr permission to do anything on the lake pumping water from the lake into like a smaller pond is probably not as feasible from the dnr standpoint but that is something we can ask and explore um okay. typically typically with those types of systems the biggest issue is going to be the, the long-term maintenance and the fact that you're only going to be able to use it you know a certain amount of months over the year given the winter and, and the and the and the fall and the spring and stuff so normally those those types of systems the first thing that kind of shoots those plans down is the maintenance cost right but it's um and then the feasible okay and then the last thing I, I really do like the the concept with the slides. Um, I know my kids and families. I know their kids would love something like that. Um, are you aware of? I heard seventy foot. Are you aware of seventy foot slides elsewhere that kind of go down the slope? My only concern is we received complaints that rocks were too close to a playground down in that area. I can only imagine the complaints of a 70 foot slide ending at a rocky path at the bottom. It has, has this been tested somewhere and, and proven to be safe for children to use? Yeah, I, you're asking the exact correct question because you're right. Um, I don't know there's, there's one once at 70. There are several in a, place, a park called Governor's Island in New York that I believe are about 40 feet tall. Um, and what what I and I've been there and I've slid down them and they're wonderful. They have a very long run out area. And I, I drew this sketch so I can be very critical of my own sketch. Um, the ending of the slide that I drew is very bad because it doesn't show what you actually need. And, and again, these are drawings were done in a hurry. You need about a 10 foot flat area for the slide to end so you slow down. Then you need a 10 foot area of sand at the bottom so you can get up before the next kid comes sliding down. So excuse my lapse here on, on this slide, um, but we would have to do research. We'd have to study that and see, is that too much? We don't want it to be too fast. We don't want it, we don't want it to be exciting, but not scary and definitely not unsafe. But these are embankment slides, so you really can't fall off it. And if you do, um, you only sort of tumble out the side. So that can be a managed condition. There's nothing to fall down onto. And one of the other things that we talked about the other night was maybe it breaks down into a series of a, there's a 10 foot high slide and a 20 foot high slide and a 40 foot high slide. In other words, you, you break them into increments that allow little kids to do a little version and you know tweens to do another version and the teenagers and the adults do the taller version. So yeah, if, if you really are interested in this, yeah, we have a lot of homework to do on this idea to make it be safe. Because first and foremost, it has to be safe. Okay. Thank you. I do like the idea um, only because looking at the, the survey results, it looks like playground was pretty, pretty low rated. Um, and without putting a full blown playground there, um, just maybe something small, like the, the slides placed wherever um, for kids to have fun while they're down there. Um, but other than that, I, I, I like the concepts. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. Chaucy? I do have a, a couple comments and maybe some questions. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Okay, so I guess I'll start here. Um, with the different options, I just want to have a, a clear understanding of which of these options can be used uh, four seasons out of the year, because we, in most of the options, we have a lot of trees, and so that means a lot of leaves, and with the leaves falling, then we also have uh, the snow, 
So are these areas just usable to sit and look at and only use during the summer and the spring? Just thinking that it, it may need to be uh, something that's a little more versatile for the multi multiple seasons. Because if you have a um, slide for the summer, maybe it's something, if snow is on it, then that would be good too for the winter. So you can use it year round. I, I would just comment that I think when we approach these designs, we fully try to intend them to be used as much of the year as possible. So I think mm -hmm. what I try and mimic is similar ac similar access and similar uses as Lake Vista, as Bender Park, so that the, this is not a park that's only designed to be used in the summer. Um, going back to the very, very first question in terms of maintenance, some snow plowing will be required, similar to Lake Vista, similar to Bender Park. So if that's a concern and a ma major issue, then rather than having, you know, trails across the entire bluff at multiple different levels, maybe it's one trail from this corner to this area and then the high activity zone is placed in one spot to limit maintenance so that you're only snow plowing in one, one area. And then just going back to the maintenance real quick, it, it, you know, in terms of mowing, the, the intention is to plant native species so that mowing is not going to be required indefinitely. There will be a mowing plan at, at the beginning that will require maintenance, but over time, those native species will not be required to be mowed consistently, uh, especially across the entire bluff. Okay, and then my next comment, uh, kind of going uh, in addition to, I should say, comments that were made earlier about every area being accessible. So my opinion, all the areas should be accessible by all types of people. Uh, those uh, that are differently able and everyone. And so I, I hear what you're saying that you're gonna create a separate path at different angles, but if you just want everybody to have a good experience when they come here. So one of my recommendations would be if, for example, you have a slide like we're showing on the screen, maybe it would be also having some things in addition, like a ride, because maybe those who can't go down the slide, they can still have a similar experience, just a little different. But we want everybody to experience this because what we see is uh, the concepts. It seems like it's a, a good idea, yet we just wanna make sure everyone in Oak Creek or anyone who comes here is able to experience this. Well, again, we I think we totally agree with that. And one of the issues that we're bringing for your consideration is, should we include accessible, handicap accessible parking down at the toe of that roadway uh, and allow folks that, that are handicapped that have those uh, tags on their vehicles that they could get a card that would allow them card access. So that we're, we're bringing that idea to you for your consideration. Well, well, this is bigger than car access. This this is access to this area, access to, give me one moment, the North Bluff. So, yes, driving to the area, that is a concern, absolutely. However, you want them to have access to all levels, meaning you said you had a upper level, a lower level, Everyone should be able to access it. It may be different, but you want people to pretty much have the same experience. So yes. I, I, I would be concerned that those that are differently able, you're telling them you can only use the lower bluff. That, that would be a concern for me and my family. I, I can't go to the upper bluff because there aren't any, there's no accessibility. So that, that would be my concern. So I just want to be clear. Yes, parking is a concern as well in um, where you would um, start your journey at this bluff. But while you're on the bluff, we want everyone to have a similar journey. 
Yes, and I would say we share your concern. Okay. I mean, the the idea of the bridge that we're proposing that goes from bluff top to bluff top is also the accessible path. So if you arrived at Lake Vista, you could walk across that bridge and you could get to North Bluff, uh, separate and apart from any parking. And then as we've been saying, there would be multiple pathways that would sort of uh, course down the three to one slope, they'd be carved into the slope at less than 5%, uh, which is the, the ADA minimum that does not uh, need to have the handrails and the level landings. It's a much more gentle slope uh, because we have the length, the, 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 the reach, the north-south reach of the North Bluff uh, is extensive. It's, it's thousands of feet. So we have plenty of ability to make that 70 foot grade change in what I would call a very elegant, graceful, comfortable way. And I think we can be well less than 5% on some of these pathways. So we, we absolutely share your concern that everybody should feel like they can get anywhere within the park. Now, uh, going to this bridge concept, so is the um, drawing an example of showing individuals being, being able to walk, ride, or move, for lack of a better term, on the bridge, and then cars will have access under the bridge? Yeah, we, we, absolutely. The, the case is true on the bridge. Uh, it'll be accessible to pedestrians, bicycles, wheelchairs, uh, non-motorized vehicles. And we're mm -hmm. showing a car on that roadway below. That, that roadway exists, and folks that maintain that water intake take cars and trucks down there all the time. So we show that in this sketch as, uh, again, if we allowed handicap uh, parking pass holders to also access that they could also drive there with a special pass and maybe also a bicycle path that would be separate from the road. So then my question would be, how would they get from the bottom if the cars are parked at the bottom? Are there stairs? Um, suggest it for the sides to get to the actual crossing? Well, I'm not sure what you're saying, but we're what we're all we're proposing to do is, is use the existing roadway um, for its main attribute, which is it has an entry right up near Fifth Street where you can go into it and gently descend down to the lake. And then once you're down there, we're showing a few spaces and a turnaround, and they would connect to what, what again, we're calling euphemistically the low road, you know, the pathway that's atop the revetment at the same grade. And then if you wanted to ascend up, you could also do that. You could go up with a wheelchair or a bicycle or a stroller or anything up several of these pathways, and they would also meet uh, the less than 5% requirement uh, for an ADA accessible pathway. But the bridge would, in fact, go over it. So yes, you're correct. When you're looking at that, that elevation, the bridge soars above it, um, above that roadway. So let me be um, uh, add a little more detail to what I was identifying. If you're driving in a car and you park underneath the bridge, how do you get to the top of the bridge? Oh, well, then you, you have to get out um, and walk up one of the paths. And you oh, probably okay. have to zigzag up a little bit. You'd have to go uh, a little bit north before you could go a little bit south. Because the bridge is up there. It's probably about mm -hmm. 60, 65 feet above your head. It really connects Lake Bluff Top to Lake Bluff Top. Mm, okay. And then one uh, additional item to potentially give uh, individuals more of a I'm on the lake experience, um, maybe a part of the bridge or a part of the extended bluff. Maybe we can have some type of a glass viewing area that you can see straight down to the lake so that it's, it's just a different experience with the lake since you may not be able to be out there. Oh, you mean like a glass paving thing so you could see through the bottom is that what you're saying? yes exactly and see straight down okay. so it could be the bridge well I'm, i was thinking of the bridge as well as the 
Uh, I think you all called it the extended bluff, where you're a certain uh, distance over the lake itself. Yeah, the bridge itself is over land. So if we did a glass bottom, so to speak, you would just be looking down at the road. But you raise an excellent point, and I have seen these things before where there is glass block or glass bottom, and it can be done, it can be designed to withstand the weight of humans. Um, and we are proposing uh, a part of the low road, if you will, um, that is a pathway that breaks free of the revetment and actually goes out over the lake so it does not touch the water intake plant. We do this for a security reason, that if you're on this boardwalk, you cannot get to the water intake plant. That might be a good place to have a little bit of, of a glass bottom to it because you will literally be out, out over the lake. But truth be told, you're only about 20 or 30 feet from the shore. This is not a major, yeah, if you look in the, at this drawing now, in the lower left-hand part, you see that, that pair of, of black lines with a white thing in between, that's representing a boardwalk. And we do that, again, for the security of the water intake plant, but also the, the, the stabilized bluff at uh, Lake Vista, is comprised of a lot of concrete rubble, recycled sidewalks and recycled rubble that while it stabilizes the slope, it is not safe to climb up. So in our judgment, we think that we don't want people to be physically attached to the land at that point. We don't want anyone to think it would be cool or fun to try to climb up that concrete rubble because there, there might be rebar that's sticking out. It's, uh, we don't think it's safe. So that's why we're proposing a pathway that's actually over the lake until it connects to a safe point uh, to an existing walkway uh, at the bottom of Lake Vista Park. And then one additional question, and I don't know who I'm planning this would be for. So I also heard them speak of a walkway past the water treatment plant. Is, is that oh, safe? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't yeah, know the you, answer to that. To connect to an mm -hmm. existing pathway. Yeah, you might have to get back to that. Oh yeah, that overall one. You see that blue line that's on the right? Yeah, that line on the right-hand side, that's an existing pathway. It is currently not accessible, but on the Eastern part, uh, or I'm sorry, the Northern part of the water treatment plant, there is an accessible path. We walked on it. And you can walk out there. Okay. There's fishermen out there. There's people you know, looking at the lake. So our thought was, if part of it can be accessible, why can't the whole thing? And then connect to the revetment that we're about to build that will create the toe of the slope of North Bluff to make a continuous walkway. And the reason we suggest that is because at the north side of the water treatment plant, there is a parking lot that is accessible off 5th Street. Um, and a pathway that are, already exists. So in effect, we'd be creating a, uh, I think it might be up to two mile long uh, walkway system all the way from Bender Park to north of the um, water treatment plant, each one of which has parking and each one of which is accessible from Fifth Street. So we think that's part of the bigger idea here. It's not just created a destination uh, at North Bluff itself, but creating the, the connective tissue, if you will, uh, to a larger system and a larger network. So, yeah. so would there be any concerns to have, well, I guess, the public using that area behind the we, treatment? Plant? We would have to consult with them and, oh, okay. and, and make sure because in, in this day and age, safety is everything. Mm -hmm. yes. It's our water source. So. Okay. That that would have to be detailed out. I think the important point here is the connectivity. Yep. And just just I would really encourage you to go to that fishing pier on the north side. It's a really beautiful access point. It's really well well maintained and well developed. But the idea would basically to mimic that across the site. It's it's fully secure from the wastewater treatment plant. So it's it, like like you mentioned, it's an option that we're exploring. But um, if you want to feel for what that walk would look like and how far out into the lake you could get. Um, I would, it's all publicly accessible as it is right now. And it's very safe. So. Yeah. We're, we're not engineering anything here. It's really just inputs. Thank you. All right. Don. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I think I'm on. Um, I, I 
like uh, somewhere between A and B. Um, it looks like, you know, just real quick, you, you could drive to the top, you can drive to the bottom, you, you have all the paths. I, I think the accessibility is clear. There's, there's plenty of it. Um, the sandbox and the waiting pool, to me, you, you said it, we got Bender Park, you've got water access, you've got sand. I would say, you know, eliminate that, save the money and do some of the more things like, you know, maybe future entertainment, but keep it, uh, keep it casual for bikers and joggers and, and no one, you know, they even have too many people going down in the middle of January. If you want to keep one path clear for the hardcore joggers and that kind of thing, that's probably really all you're going to get down there. Um, so I, I, th I love the bridge. I, th I think the bridge is, is cool. You've got a, uh, you've got a playground up on, um, uh, Vista, you you could put another little something. I I personally don't think the slide's necessary. Kind of cool in concept, but um, you know, uh, overall, I, I think you're you. It's it's looking good. I do love the pier. I love the the loop pier. Um, you know, so the pier, yes. I'm sandbox waiting pool. Not 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 really. Uh, other than that, yeah, I think you guys have some pretty good ideas here. That's it. Chris? Um, well, from my perspective, we're trying to get some functionality out of this property. Um, so I like all of the concepts that were presented. Um, and I like a, a donor probably between A and B. Um, I think that the, the bridge is uh, very awesome. Um, and I think uh, as long as we make sure that there's connectivity, um, be throughout the park from one end to the other. Um, I don't know that I think because of Lake Vista, I don't think that I wouldn't push to put in a bunch of amenities here because we have, I think, enough at Lake Vista. So, thanks. Uh, Assistant Chief Havey, would you like to comment from fire's perspective or a personal perspective? As long as you're sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been a long time Oak Creek resident, so. Yeah, uh, I think that it is a very interesting concept plan. Um, you know, some of the, the safety concerns were addressed, so I think that would be primarily from the fire department perspective, as long as there's a, a, a safe um, park that's usable for, for all the residents. And I, I do see the, uh, the ADA issues as well that, that should be addressed. So I do, I, I like all of them actually. So it's, I think getting to that point where, you know, what, what's the most feasible part right. for the community and from a fire perspective, you know, you do have access to that. Our fireworks go on down there. So you guys do get down to the utility regularly, but everything has to be accessible down there. If, if, if an episode happens, it has to be able to accommodate the, the ambulance and the fire trucks. Yeah, we do have um, a UTV type vehicle that's set up for off-road. So we, we've utilized that before at certain points in time. Um, as this area develops, I think we'll have to uh, also really look at our, our what we are responding to. And here's some of that off-road areas or wildland areas that seem to be a little more, um, going to be more accessible in the future. Correct. And not that you're foreign to it because you have been down to Bender Park many times or the power plant pier. What challenges does the pier bring to fire? Um, I, you know, from the perspective of water safety, um, so water safety is, is a huge concern because of more and more people out near the water and accessing into the water. Um, open waters are you know, probably the most dangerous part of, of um, really being close to that. You get certain areas of the lake that have currents that are more dangerous than others. North Point and we're seeing and some other areas, Port Washington, have seen um, several fatalities for the last few years. So anytime there's more and more access to you know, open waters like me, Lake Michigan, whether it's fishing or piers or just young people that are getting adventurous, you know, that causes some concerns. There are some things that are, that are happening with um, Save Kids coalitions that they're using um, loaner stations for things such as um, floating devices at beaches um, because they're not lifeguarded typically in Milwaukee County. So those are things we'd start exploring as to what, how can we make the open waters as safe as we can um, based on how many uh, of, of the activities or the volume of people start more, start using more of those, those facilities as they become developed. Right. 
Thank you for the input. Sure, appreciate it. Um, guess I'll go real quick. Just want to say everybody had really good points and input, and I'm probably going to repeat it because you guys hit a lot of the points. But first and foremost, as Fred brought up, it's, it's this is really about bluff, bluff stabilization. It's the whole reason we're going for this. It's not like we really need to extend this park and put in amenities for a concert or anything like that. We have plenty of that throughout the city uh, to do it. I see this more as a continuation of Lake Vista Park, as Chris put it. The amenities are out there. This is a more natural passive use park to me. Um, the concepts out there, the A1 and uh, the B2, as you guys said, combination of them. I like the trails, uh, the multiple trails that go through there for walking, hiking, wintertime skiing, mountain biking, multi-purpose for what people want to do. Uh, parking. Parking is key. If we're going to spend this money, we have to put parking amenities up on that up on the top bluff, um, or we got the fireworks down there. We have more and more people coming to Lake Vista. Uh, that is key. Also the parking down below that gives the accessibility for the ADA that we talked about quite a bit. But this is really important and they hit on this. It's connectivity, getting from the water, the, I'm sorry, the processing plant South Shore all the way to Bender Park. And that's not hard really to accomplish, whether we do it through the bridge or we do it through a, a fancy pier around uh, the, the, the water treatment plan. I, I don't know where the answer lies with that one. We just got to make that connection. The trails are already at Lake Vista and it would be a short jaunt to connect that up to Bender. And then we have a system similar to what the county has between really um, Bayview Beach and all the way through Grant Park. Those trails connect for biking and walking and enjoyment that way. So I think that's huge. Um, the lights, yeah, the slides are cool, but I do agree uh, with the architects. You can't have a 70 foot slide down there. We, I just can't imagine the compliance officer and everybody dealing with that. So you, as he said, you'd have to go with a 10 foot slide to a platform, another 15 feet with stairs where parents could monitor and walk whatever, but I don't think that's a necessity. I actually like the natural features where they climb. You know, you got the logs and stuff. If the kid's a little more uh, adventurous and wants to go that route um, along the sides would be fine with me. Um, but it's the trails. Keep this park as natural as possible. We talk about maintenance all the time. Um, the tower is really cool. Um, there is no way we're putting in a year-round use elevator facing the lake. You know, un unoccupied, put it this way, it would be unoccupied and unsupervised. Um, fire department would be spending a lot of time. At lake. <laughs> um, so again, I do think it's cool. Um, you know, we want that standoff feature. Maybe it's the bridge or a pier. Um, I do like the, nat the jet outs for passive use on the lake, whether it's kayaking, paddle boat, uh, things of that nature. Um, the water feature down there, you know, you talked about, oh, we pump the water in, we make a beach. The water feature is the lake. It's natural. <laughs> Anything we build can't, can't beat nature. So I, I wouldn't mess with that. That's a whole lot of maintenance uh, fooling around there. Um, and then low maintenance. We talked about bathrooms. Um, obviously, as they said, the bathrooms would be on the top end uh, if needed. Um, I spend a lot of time, and I used to spend a lot of time in some natural uh, national parks. They utilize solar toilets quite a bit. And uh, I, I don't know the full functionality of them, but they, they're seasonal. And, and they're locked up at the end of the season. But throughout the summer, uh, basically, it's like a big compost, and it's, it's, it's taken out of there at the end of the year. Something we could look at. We've never done that here, but in a, in a site like this, it would be a heck of a money saver and would be environmentally friendly. So um, it, it's really neat. Uh, this is coming along quickly. So I don't know where parks fell on this. We did see this. Um, it's a challenging site, but it's an exciting site. And I think it should complement Lake Vista. And, uh, you know, this should look like this is how it flows. So when the features are down there for benches or what have you, 
utilize giant stones and boulders like we do over on the north side of City Hall at uh, Mayor Bolander Plaza over there um, and, and use those natural features. So um, it's really neat. And it's not to say that you can't have a little one-man band down there. I've been to Bender Park. They hosted beer gardens there. They have little one- and two-man bands going on down there. But uh, we also have that capability at Lake Vista as well if we're going to have large crowds. Um, now, people that want to go down there to watch fireworks, you know, you'd be able to get down there on shore and, and camp out of sight. But it would be more natural, much like much like a lot of Whitnall Park is. So um, those are my points of view. Um, but it, it's exciting. And we have a really unique piece of property and, and something to do here. And overall maintenance really has to be considered. Um, I wouldn't want to see our parks department down there trying to mow and, and keep grass. I would keep it natural, metal, prairie, things like that. Um, actually, maybe make it a little like Schlitz Audubon experience where people could walk those trails through nature and maybe they naturally attract birds or butterflies or what have you, things like that. So that's my two cents. Carrie, I'm going to turn it to you. So I just want to clarify, and perhaps I should have done this at the beginning of the presentation, but I wanted to make sure that we were able to get through the slides and have this wonderful discussion. The reason that we're bringing these images to you is two parts, and it has been said a couple of times already. We are doing a bluff stabilization project. That is number one. But as part of that, we were thinking, and this is why we're discussing this with you and the Parks and Rec Commission, is we have an opportunity to, here to actually create something unique. We have the, connect, the opportunity to do the connectivity. Rather than just a bluff stabilization project, why don't we make it into something that creates more public access to this area? This is not a one, two, three, four option. Please consider if you like something from B1, B2, A1, whatever it is, this is something that you can kind of a la carte. And it's also something that we can phase. So the bluff stabilization portion is going to happen. Anything that happens above and beyond that, that's icing on the cake, so to speak. So if we want to plan this out and we say we want to have trails and parking and access as phase one, maybe phase two, we talk about having a warming hut or looking into bathroom options, or if we want to, you know, have more intense, I don't want to say intense, we have more interesting features that we can add later, we can certainly talk about a phasing plan. But I would encourage you to think about these as jumping off points to, st to stir your creativity. They're great images. I think everybody liked concepts from all portions of it. Same thing happened with the Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, I think they really liked the slides option, honestly, but they weren't necessarily too heavy on, well, I want this, this image. This is the one that I'm gravitating towards. I think they were starting to pick and choose from all sorts of uh, portions of each one of the concepts as well. So if there's something missing, like for instance, the ADA uh, capabilities, make that more um, of a feature, make that more prominent, or at least clearer in these images, that's that's great. If you want to keep coming up with those ideas, you can certainly pass them along to myself. You can pass them along to Jack or to Doug. Uh, we're going to be the point people on this project. Um, if you have questions about the bluff stabilization project, the environmental component itself, uh, you might want to contact Sue Winnen. Um, she's also involved in this project from that perspective. Uh, we can also pass along all of your comments, questions, concerns. If you have them post this meeting, we can pass them along to the consultants so that they have the opportunity to uh, address those in future revisions. We're not done, um, but we wanted to make sure that we got more input from, from everybody on this project. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there. We yeah, do, I, I apologize. We did no, book an, an hour for this yeah. conversation. It's been great, but we do kind of have to keep moving. Keep moving. <laughs> so again, you know, it, it's beautiful concepts, but again, the trails can be a mix of asphalt, gravel, bark, whatever. So it's just conceptual. And I want to thank you guys. I know we went over a little bit um, and we have a few people here that are waiting on their items. So I'm sure they're, they're anxious to get going. So I'm going to bid you guys adieu. Thank you for the time. All thank right. you. All right. Thank you.
Okay. Um, moving on. Um, where are we? Uh, first public hearing, uh, a sign appeal for a proposed sign um, for Oak Creek Hotel Associates LLC that allow the applicants to install various signs on the south elevation of the proposed building on the property in 92-93 South 13th. Carrie, would you like to properly read that in the record? Certainly. City of Oak Creek notice of public hearing before the Plan Commission, a public hearing for a sign appeal will be heard, held September 13, 2022 at 6 p.m. in the Common Council Chambers. The appellant is Oak Creek Hotel Associates, Associates LLC, tax key 877-9025-000. The property location is 9293 South 13th Street. This is to request a variance from section 170604A4, which states a maximum of one primary wall sign shall be permitted per lot frontage of a single tenant building. If granted, the variance would allow the applicant to install one 14 foot 7.36 inch by 8 foot 2.3 inch or a total of 119.71 square feet wall sign on the south elevation. The zoning of the property is B4 PUD. It's no longer a CUP. Uh, highway Business District Plan Unit Development. All interested persons wishing to be heard are invited to be present. Dated this day, 19th day of August 2022. Plan Commission, City of Oak Creek, Mayor Dan Bikavich, Chairman. This is a public hearing and all those who wish to speak, please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record and address your comments to the plan commission. This hearing is now open. However, I would like to provide a little bit of background before we have any others speak. The sign appeal is for a hotel on the property and plan commissioners may remember this from 2020. Um, they are allowed under the new code or the existing code to have one wall sign per street frontage based on the orientation of this particular lot however there is no true street frontage uh, they do have a shared access point with a shared access easement with the property that was subdivided um, on 13th street and steinhoffels to the north so because of that they were allowed to have one sign on the north side because that's facing the access point that's also the entry elevation and now they're requesting one that's kind of a mirror image on the opposite corner um, on the south. The two additional signs that are proposed for this building uh, do not require variances, but they're in here for your information. Uh, they may look slightly familiar. This is the location of the sign in question for the variance this evening. In terms of sign, it matches the proposed sign on the north elevation. It is within code compliant um, measurements. When considering a variance for a sign appeal, the plan commission has several options to consider anything other than content. And staff do not make recommendations when it comes to variances. If you have questions, I can certainly provide more information. Uh, this hearing is now open. Thank you, Carrie. As Carrie said, we'll make three calls. This will be the first. Anybody wishing to speak? Second call, anybody wishing to speak on the sign appeal? Third and final call. We will now close the public hearing and move on to consideration in 9A of that sign appeal that we just spoke of. Um, is the applicant with us? You want to say a few words before I put it to the commission or just wait on questions? I don't want to say anything. Okay. Um, let's start it off. Uh, Chaucey, you want to start? Sure. Uh, just a quick question, Carrie. I want to make sure I understand their request today. There is a sign identified for the north side, which is uh, meets the requirements, yet the one on the south is in addition to that's the one we need the variance those are the only two signs on the building those are the only two wall signs that are proposed on the building that okay. would require um, a permit or plan commission review okay the only other sign that's proposed uh, that would need a permit would be the monument sign but that does not require a variance okay thank you Fred, uh, is this sign illuminated at all Yes, internally eliminated channel letters. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Don? I have, I have no questions. Chris? No questions. Greg? Um, no questions. Thanks. Ashley? Nothing. Thank you. 
Don? Nothing for me. Christine? Nothing here. Nothing for me either. I'm glad to see it's going. So um, if there's no further discussion or questions, uh, motion on 9A, please. Super moves that the Planning Commission approves sign variance allowing the insulation of one 14 feet, 7.36 inches by 8 feet, 2.3 inches wall sign on the southwest corner of the proposed building on the property at 9293 South 13th Street. And a second. And a second. Uh, roll call beginning with Ashley. Shinsky, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Kuzikowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Seaford, aye. Chandler, aye. Anna, aye. Rillo, aye. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, next is 9B, and that is a plan review, uh, review site, building, landscape, and related plans um, for the same property we just talked on, now hotel at 9293 South 13th Street. Carrie. And this is for the building itself. Um, Basically, in 2020, we reviewed the building, and of course, that was under the previous zoning code, and it was recommended, it was approved with uh, conditions. However, for various reasons, you know, the, the building permit was not sought, and those, um, those approvals lapsed. They, they expired. What's interesting is in between when that building was reviewed and now, it no longer needs a conditional use permit. It is still subject to a PUD. Uh, but that PUD is not relevant to what we're reviewing tonight. So the proposal is again for a 42,000, roughly 43,000 square foot hotel that was originally reviewed in April of 2020. And of course the CUP is no longer uh, required. It is a 92 guest room facility that has multiple amenities included in it. So it is not considered an extended stay under the zoning code. It will include a market and separate pantry, fitness center, indoor pool, and laundry services. Laundry services are not self-serve coin-op. They are provided by the hotel. Uh, it does have shared access, as mentioned, under the previous item um, that is existing through easement. That's been something that's been in place for many decades. Minimum parking requirements for hotels under the current code are one stall for every occupiable room, which would mean 92 stalls would be required. However, only 88 stalls are shown in the plans. So this is uh, an area that the plan commission would need to make a determination on as to whether or not uh, the additional parking stalls would be required or if 88 stalls is going to be sufficient. I will remind you that they did under the 2020 review mention that uh, they anticipated about the same occupancy as other similar area hotels, which at the time was approximately 68.7%, which equates to about 65 rooms booked on any given night. Whether or not that still holds true, that's something that would have to be provided by the applicant. Um, but that's how the original approval got to about 90 stalls as being what would be a, uh, a requirement under the previous code, but 65 stalls was the bare minimum. Um, under the current code, section 170501 sub I allows adjustments for parking, but no request has been received. So again, this is defaulting to the plan commission to determine whether or not those four extra stalls are gonna be required. We do also recommend as part of the code requirements that bike parking be considered for this site, um, simply just an area for people to kind of hitch up their bikes overnight, um, bike rack would suffice. Turning now to the landscape plan, uh, this is pretty much unchanged from what was reviewed in 2020. However, there are some code compliance issues that we need to incorporate into revi revised plans uh, prior to permitting. Um, some of those details are missing. Uh, some of the code compliance issues are related to the tree inventory and preservation and replacement plan requirements. Uh, won't get into the real details of that right now, there aren't many trees on the site to begin with, but there is a requirement for not only identification, but replacement of removal under certain criteria. So we're just gonna continue to work with the applicant to make sure that the landscape plan and the tree inventory and preservation and replacement program are compliant with code. And this is a copy of the preservation plan. As you can see, again, not many trees on the site to begin with. So it's not all, 
a lot that we would have to talk about in terms of uh, code compliance. Turning now to the building, um, a few minor additions, well, they're not entirely minor, but a few minor additions uh, in terms of what we reviewed in 2020. Most of the building design is exactly the same. On the north and the uh, west elevations, you will notice that there have been some increases in the brick. So we'll get into the the details of the materials themselves. Most of the building is actually going to be comprised of hardy panel. This is not something that we haven't seen in previous iterations. Um, we are also seeing on the plans proposal for utility brick, which is for the measurement uh, argument 12 by 4 by 4. And that's along the base. And that base extends around the entirety of the building. And that's along the first floor. Uh, utility thin brick, which is measurement 11 and 5 eighths inches by 3 and 9 sixteenths inches, are shown again on the north and the west elevations. Those are kind of your frontage elevations, if you will. Um, on the second and third floors, essentially. Now, we do allow in the current zoning code the use of thin brick with a minimum dimension of one inch on floors above the base floor. So this is something that we have worked with the applicants to get to. Uh, the percentages themselves are not necessarily exactly what is required by code, but they get very close. So as mentioned in the report, this will be something that the Planning Commission would have to determine as to whether or not what's shown is uh, acceptable or if the additional maybe 3% is something that you would be holding the applicants to meet. It's a little bit uh, different because when we get to the other elevations, that brick on the second and, and third floors is not reflected. So this is a code compliance um, requirement and it's, it, it is required on the frontage elevations. Uh, this particular parcel is a little bit interesting because if it doesn't have 13th street frontage and we don't necessarily count the freeway as frontage, however, those uh, the freeway uh, elevation is a presentation to the public, and the north is the presentation to the public. We're anticipating that there would be a building that would be east of this building, which would block the presentation to 13th Street, which this building is already more than 100, maybe 200 feet from that anyway. So a little bit more information than you probably needed to know. Just understand that the north and the west elevations were the ones that particularly changed. Uh, windows are provided on all sides of the hotel, uh, majority on the northeast because that's where the entry facade is. EFIS as accents are utilized mostly as canopies and at the parapets. Um, RTUs, as you can see in the north elevation, are screened with six foot tall metal panels. Any other mechanical units, utilities, transformers, all of those things, they would have to be equally screened. Um, by use of landscaping or fencing per code. So again, east and west don't necessarily look exactly the same, but there are different features on each of these elevations. And of course, the south looks relatively similar to the north, but again, that brick doesn't go up the second and third floor. Trash enclosure is going to have brick that matches the building, metal gates on the front, it's in a code compliant location and there is landscaping in the plan to soften those areas uh, on the on the corner. And this is not something that's going to be um, necessarily seen from the street. Do not have anything in the slide presentations for lighting, but there was information included in your packets regarding the fixtures. Now we do have a maximum cutoff uh, a maximum of 500 of 5,000 kelvins for the parking lot fixtures, which also must be full cut off, fully shielded, and directed downward light sources. With regard to the building mounted um, lights themselves, they are actually limited to lamps of with a maximum of 2,000 source lumens. It's a different type of uh, way of measuring the, the lighting. Uh, they are also required to stay on the building, essentially. You can't go over the building lines, and they cannot be mounted above the uh, highest point of the building. These are not located in an area where they would have an issue with um, 
spill spillover or they are not proposed to be mounted too high anyway. So it's really just a matter of making sure that those um, maximum color temperatures and lumens are met in the code. We mentioned the signs previously, and I'm not going to go into that here. Um, monument sign is going to be outside of any easements. It's going to meet all of the, the setback requirements. And of course, the two signs on the building we've already talked about. One more thing to mention, there was a requirement under the previous um, review, and it's going to be something that has to happen for this one as well. There is a real requirement for reauthorization of the Army Corps of Engineers determination, as well as any DNR permits or approvals. They are aware of that and they're working toward that right now. With that in mind, there is a suggested motion in three parts for plan commission consideration on the screen. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so again, this kind of got held up. We all know what happened in 2020 uh, when this came through about a month as we we're in the pandemic. We probably actually did this Zoom wise. But um, nevertheless, here we are. So um, does the applicant want to come up or wait on questions? Anybody want to wait? OK, um, Christine, you want to start us off? Uh, I just have one question and maybe it was answered and I missed it. So why that um, brick is only on the first, I guess, uh, the first and the second floor, not the third one? What's the reason behind it, I guess? So originally the building only had brick on the base, so on the, the ground level floor. Everything else was hardy panel and that had to go through the plan commission for specific approval under the previous code. Under the new code, they are held to a different material standard based on the elevation. And it's the, the code has a chart that was included in your reports, basically says for interior, exterior side, interior side, street frontage, those kinds of things, those have certain materials percentages requirements. This was a compromise in order to get them closer to where they needed to be for those particular um, elevations that were more out of compliance than the others. That's a zone requirement that they had to meet pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks. No, nothing for me. Ashley? Nothing for, from engineering. Thank you. Greg? Um, the overall building, I, I mean, I like it. Looks like all the other Avid hotels I've seen before. Um, there wasn't really much change that I noticed and it was stated in the report from the last thing. Um, as far as the parking, normally, I, I don't think it would be an issue. Um, it's only four stalls. Um, however, I did note in the uh, information that it looks like the applicant provided to the city. It does say that individual commercial business travel and weekend leisure travel in Oak Creek hotel market drives demand in the lodging market, including numerous sellout days throughout the year. If there are numerous sellout days, um, there's 92 rooms. I guess you can assume possibly a, a car per room, um, if not two, if there's double beds, um, with some people probably flying in and taking ride shares or taxis. Um, is there a, they're clearly not parking up 13th Street. Is there any type of agreement with Steinhoffels for overflow parking? No, however, and this is not something that really can be considered now because it's a future condition, but the parcel to the east that shares a property line. It was intended for that to be developed at least in 2020 with a future restaurant that may have excess parking that could, could be utilized. Until that happens, however, parking on the site has to be considered. So it's one of those situations where yeah, I'm, I, don't, I can't speak for the applicant as to whether or not they've had any con uh, conversations with Steinhoffels for overflow parking, but I do know that in 2020, that was the plan for the restaurant to share parking. I mean, I, I guess I don't have too much of a concern over it. Um, I live here, I won't be staying at the hotel, but I definitely get irritated when I do stay at a hotel and there's nowhere to park. Um, I guess from the applicant, if do you have, do you have concerns that there might not be enough spots? We will need your name and address for the record, sir. And um, 
you know, we did have enough stalls at one point. We had to add some more landscaping part of the new code, so we did lose some stalls. Um, we can definitely talk to Steinhoffel. We had a good relationship with them about getting some excess stalls or whatever we need be. So I'm not that worried about it. All right. Yeah, there, there are no double beds in this one at all, so it's all kings. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chris? Um, I think it looks good, and uh, I have no other questions. Huh? No questions. Brad? No questions. Chaucer? I do have uh, one quick question. So there is uh, one of the items states that brick on the ground floor has to be a minimum of a three inches thick. So is that being met for that first floor? It, it's being met, correct. Okay. Yes, we're four, four inches thick on the first floor. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, oh, Mike, come on up. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good evening again, uh, Mike Avery with Fire. Uh, the previous uh, application, so the shared access was accommodating for the fire department, but I just wanted to stipulate that uh, the the shared fire protection is not part of. Um, we would need to have private fire protection also for that separate building because what is on sign office property is private fire hydrants. So that just stipulated that shared access is okay on that, but the private fire protection lines will need to be installed for that development. That was always the case even in 2020, correct? I just wanted to make sure that that was the case because 2020 is a little bit fuzzy, so I just wanted to make sure that I did stipulate okay. that. I was going to say if it, if it was, if that's something it, that changed in two years. It, yeah, I, I believe it was, but I just wanted to make sure that was stipulated. Okay, thank you. Um, I myself have no, no questions either, and uh, Greg pretty much put the parking to rest, so... I think we're good. Uh, looking for a motion then. Aldani moves. Aldani moves that the plan commission approves the site and building plan submitted by Bruce Kinseth and Craig Sadownikow, Oak Creek Hotel Associations, LLC, for a hotel at the property at 9293 South 13th Street with the following conditions. One, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Two, that the plans are revised to incorporate an area for bicycle park, parking per code. Three, that the brick in the ground floor base level to a minimum of three feet above grade, the minimum of three inch thick. Brick utilized on upper floors must be a minimum of one inch thick and structurally integrated into the facade of the building. Four, that the plans are revised to include locations for all mechanicals, transformers, and utilities. All mechanical equipment, transformers, and utility boxes, ground, building, and rooftops shall be screened from view. Five, that lighting plans are revised to meet code requirements. All light sources shall be full cutoff fixtures with light source fully shielded and directed downward. The color temperature of the non-building mounted fixture shall be limited to a maximum of 5,000 kelvins. Architectural accent wash lighting and wall mounted lighting are limited to lamps with 2,000 source lumens or less, shall not spill over roof lines or building edges, and shall not be mounted higher than the highest point of the building, excluding RTU screens. Six, the permits are obtained for all signs. Seven, that the landscape plans and tree preservation and replacement plan are revised to meet code requirements. Eight, that a reauthorization of the Army Corps of Engineers permit is obtained and any Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources approvals, exemptions are renewed with copies provided to the city prior to submission of building permit applications. Nine, that all revised plans, site building, landscaping, et cetera, are submitted in digital format for review by the Department of Community Development prior to the submission of building permit applications. Mr. Kowski, a second. Uh, roll call beginning with Greg. Mark, aye. Kavich, aye. Grzykowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Supervise. Chambler, aye. And aye. Rilla, aye. Chinsky, aye. Okay. Great. Thanks very much. Thank um, next up, we got a plan review, uh, site landscape related plans uh, for the 145 foot tall monopole, five foot lightning rod for 150 total. Um, Total feet in the apparatus of the gated and fence compound on a portion of property at 2509 
Wes Drexel. So we've all seen this. Carrie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is required, even though there was a conditional use permit uh, that was issued and approved by the Common Council on May 17th. Again, this is for the site itself. And this is only on a portion of that property, which is more than 700 feet from Drexel Avenue into the interior. Um, there was no requirement since the CUP was issued or actually reviewed by the Plan Commission prior to the adoption of the current zoning code uh, for aesthetic standards that are included in code now. So that will be up to the Plan Commission whether or not any or all of the aesthetic standards would be required. But again, that was not required as part of the conditional use permit. So the site plan has not necessarily changed much or at all from what was reviewed during the conditional use permit consideration. Again, there are no existing buildings on the site itself. Um, it is not going to be an illuminated site. This is simply a pole with appurtenances within a gated and fenced compound, as the mayor stated. The leased area is a little bit larger than what the gate will be. Um, it's a 70 by 80 leased area, and the enclosed area is going to be 65 by 75, enclosed with a six-foot tall chain link fence with about a foot of barbed wire on top. That'll be accessed by a 30 foot wide easement from Drexel Avenue on the site itself. The gravel driveway is 12 feet wide to the site. In Within the enclosure, uh, the pole, the equipment, future carrier lease areas, that's all required to be within the gated area. The only exception, as we mentioned during the conditional use permit review was a bollard transformer and fiber optic vault. That's just outside of the fenced area, but it is still within the um, 25 foot wide uh, utility easement that's on the property. So staff have no concerns. That had to be outside for various reasons, um, particularly for access by We Energies. As mentioned in the staff report, green infrastructure is also required for this project. Um, those plans need to note the net increase in impervious surface with the project as well. Rain gardens were included in the plans, but they do need to have permits issued by the engineering department. The one thing that was missing, it was mentioned during the conditional use permit review and we reiterate, reiterate it now, even though we did get a letter of, of non-objection from the FAA, we did not get anything from Milwaukee County Airport specifically. So if that could be provided prior to any permits being issued, we'd appreciate it. And with that, there is a suggested motion in two parts for plan commission consideration. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, you want to say a few words? Only if the commission has any questions. Okay, well, name and address, and uh, we'll see what they have. Uh, Michael Long, 511 North Broadway, Milwaukee, 53202. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, uh, Chelsea, you want to start us off? Surely. I have a question. Once again, I'm not sure who would answer this. Uh, for these different um, wireless towers or poles, is there a requirement of how many you can have in a certain distance? Because to my understanding, is this our third one in Oak Creek? There's no limitation mm -hmm. in the city, in the code, and I believe that we are restricted by statute on it, what we can actually restrict, and I don't believe that we can restrict the number in the city. Quantity. Oh, you are correct. Okay. Okay. So what are the restrictions? Not quantity, not distance, not size of the city? No. Uh, it, it, this, it's, the statutes that were included in your report, that's basically what we can yeah. do. Okay. in terms of uh, regulatory allowances per statute. And in our code, we do have a couple other things, which again, are those aesthetic cons considerations that we didn't have as part of the conditional use review, but we do have in the code now, um, kind of like making it look a little stealthy. Um, no issues in terms of what they are proposing from staff's perspective. So if there's anything that the plan commission wishes to discuss with re regard to aesthetics, again, 700 feet back. I know it's a large pole, but we're not going to disguise it as a tree. So that's for the Pine Commission to determine. Thank and you. it's also not painted um, anything reflective, just to make that clear. Okay. And is it, uh, this question is for the applicant, is 
a part of the plan to get uh, feedback, did you say from the airport, Carrie? Yes, Milwaukee County yes. Airport. Yes, um, okay. so the, the city has asked for us to uh, basically just provide some uh, writing from the uh, airport indicating that they do not object to the proposed site. We will now go forward and obtain that. And But you should know that uh, we've double-checked the airport's height limitation zoning ordinance that they have, and this um, uh, proposed tower site falls outside of that. So that shouldn't be an issue with the airport then. But we'll go forward and get that now from the airport. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, Fred? Yeah, the fencing around the pole and the transformer, what type of fencing do you have for that? It, it's a chain link fence, and it's, I want to say it's six feet high, and then on top of it, there's a few strands of barbed wire. What about the road access to that facility? I believe that there is a, a gate there now, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I can't really, so. but there is a, at, at Drexel, there is a gate. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, no questions. Chris? The gate may actually be on the property to the west. Yes. But there's an existing uh, paved drive there, and you can see there's kind of a an extended asphalt area. The gravel drive that goes straight down to the site, that's just going to be off of the existing. There's going to be no change to the curb cut, the driveway access. Right. And I think those are some of the conditions of approval on the condition use permit is that we weren't allowed to change the access at all from, from Drexel. Uh, Don, you got the floor. Uh, no questions. Chris? No questions. Greg? Um, pending the approvals, do you have a time frame when this is going in? If uh, if we have all our other regulatory approvals at the federal level taken care of, it would probably be going in either sometime later this fall or early spring. Um, and then, as always, I feel like I say it every time there's a poll. I wish they could all be decorated like trees. Um, nobody's a fan, really, of a poll going up, but luckily this one is pretty secluded away from larger residential areas. Um, and, and truthfully, they're becoming such commonplace that I don't really notice them anymore. Yeah. Anywhere. So but. this one may be hard to see from Drexel. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Ashley? Nothing from me. Thank you. Right. Uh, Nothing from me. Nothing here. Nope. No, not from me. And I'll, I'll just make the comment from my house. There's actually two poles located at, I could probably see if I try, but now that they're in and they blend, they're just there. And I don't even notice. One's, one's right behind our DPW and you don't even notice it anymore. So, um, I have nothing. So um, we can go for a motion on that. Clerk moves to approve the site and building plan submitted by J. Michael Long, Central States Tower V, LLC, and Selco Partnership, DBA Verizon Wireless, for a wireless communications pole and compound on the property at 2509 West Drexel Avenue with the following conditions. Number one, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Number two, that the facility is not illuminated beyond that required for compliance with federal or state regulations. Number three, that all facility equipment and pole are located within the approved fenced and gated compound, the bollard transformer and fiber optic vault on the northeast corner of the lease area may be located outside of the fence. Number four, no signs other than those required for compliance with federal or state regulations are approved. Five, grading and green infrastructure plans must be approved and permitted by the engineering department. Six, approval from Milwaukee County for compliance with General Mitchell International Airport. Sitting and siting and safety requirements shall be provided to the Department of Community Development prior to submission of permit applications. Seven, that all revised plans, site, building, landscaping, et cetera, are submitted in digital format for review that by the Department of Community Development prior to the submission of permit applications. Who's the coast kill second? 
Uh, roll call beginning with myself. I. Kuzikowski, aye. Hold on, aye. Seepert, aye. Chandler, aye. And I. Hello, aye. Shinsky, aye. Park, aye. Thanks, sir. Yep, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you, too. Um, gets us to 9D, uh, review certified survey map um, for the property at 150 West Forest Hill Avenue. It will be a division of that property. Uh, Carrie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is a request to divide the property into two commercial lots and one outlot. The outlot currently contains stormwater infrastructure on the property. This property is not accessed directly from Forest Hill Avenue, but via easements around uh, and actually on the property itself through private development driveways that are currently in existence. On the screen right now are the first three pages of the certified survey map. So page number one is at the far left, and it does note that you should see sheet two for existing easements and sheet two with the existing easements is shown in the middle. Um, there is a proposal for new easements on sheet three, uh, but for clarity, I, staff is recommending that sheet one just say, see subsequent sheets for any and all easements. Um, it's just a little bit easier that way that, you know, we often see that people only get sheet one of a CSM and then they don't realize that there are other things that are happening on the property unless there's a notation. Um, that's why we'd like to see everything on the first one, but understand that not everything can be le legible whenever you have it all on sheet one. So please note, on sheet one, all easements are on subsequent sheets. The proposed lots are code compliant in terms of dimensions and minimum lot size requirements. Um, there does need to be an agreement between the two created lots for access and maintenance and responsibility of the stormwater infrastructure in out lot one. That does need to be recorded and that copy does need to be provided to the city, but a notation does need to be included on the certified survey map that such is required. Um, the stormwater facility needs to benefit both lots. That needs to be explicit. Development of both lots one and two are going to be required to meet the code requirements at the time of application. Uh, the certified survey map does not grandfather or lock in any code requirements uh, for future development, just to make that clear. There is a proposal for an access easement over lots one and two to be shared from that existing access over the both of the lots that's for um, use of anybody within the development. This is for access to Woodman's and all of the other uh, commercial development in there. However, the trash enclosure easement is something that staff would like to have removed. Um, that is because we do not have a proposal for lot two at this time. We don't know what it would be developed with. And since we would be requiring that every lot, uh, both lots be compliant with code in place at the time of development, um, we don't know where that is going to go. So we want that trash enclosure easement removed so that we have the opportunity to provide um, an appropriate location for site and building plan review in the future, should this move forward. There is also a requirement for bearings and distances to be included in the surveyor's certificate. Um, that's on a page that was included in your report, but not on the screen. And it is a little bit difficult to read some of the notations due to the typeface and the bold face font. So we would want that to uh, be have everything be legible on the CSM prior to recording. With that in mind, there is a suggested suggested motion in two parts for plan commission consideration. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, before we go to the commission, would you like to say a few words or wait on questions, sir? Need your name and address. Certainly. Gary Went, Bradford Real Estate Companies, 106 Barrington Commons Court, Suite 726, Barrington, Illinois. Bradford is the contract purchaser, and we do have letter of support from the current owner, uh, Demco, on, on this uh, request. We have uh, read and worked with, with Carrie and, and agree with all of the comments made. So 
I just wanted to uh, be here for to respond to any questions. Okay, great. Uh, Christine, you want to start? I have no questions, actually. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Don? No, I don't either. Um, Ashley? Nothing from me. Thank you. Greg? Um, one question, and this might uh, this might be for the next item. Is this for a new child care facility? Yes, it is a proposed new child care facility right. on on lot two, the northern lot. Okay, is this this right across the street from another one? That's um, not Ebenezer, the same yes. one. That's, okay. that, the conditional I use can... permit request is in the next agenda item. Plan uh, site and building plan review would come subsequent to that review, okay. not tonight. So you're dividing this to do a child care center and then an additional commercial building. That's correct. Thank you. Yes. No questions. Uh, no questions. Uh, Fred? No questions. Jossie? No questions. Thank you. Um, well, I'll have some. So, it, I mean, it's your property and, and what have you, but by dividing it east to west like you're doing, the front of the building, we, we always want forward facing on a street, which is Forest Hill in this case, it's gonna be difficult to position these buildings with access, isn't it? So the uh, existing uh, storm water management pond prevents any access to Forest Hill Drive. Right. We looked at uh, the building facing the north, if you will, at Woodman's, and there are actually restrictions in place for this, this area, these shared private driveways, that we can only have access uh, to the west. And that's why we're, we will be proposing a, a shared driveway for both properties. And then Woodman's is also uh, allowing a second driveway where the trash enclosure was illustrated on the east side. east side. So you'd have access on those two private roads from the east and west. Right. So when the daycare goes in, will the formal front of the daycare be facing south? It'll be facing west. So the, I'll have, the, the so driveway. I'll have, so I'll have a building not facing a road. It, it is facing the, the private road. I, is there a peak ahead? Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, if you if you take if, if you take everything done around Woodman's, you know, to the Burger King to whatever, they're all front facing Howell Avenue, and the access comes from the back or the north or the south, but they're facing east. Now we got a build, you know. Now we got a building that's doing an about face in the whole thing. This would be face to face with the existing daycare center across the street. It would be, but that's also the side of it that that daycare faces Forest Hill. Of course, they don't have the access issue. You do. The, our primary entrance will be face to face. I, I don't care where the primary entrance okay. is. I'm just saying the face of the building. I'd like to see facing. Forest Hill. And that's something that can be conditioned as part of site and building plan review um, because the daycare itself doesn't require conditional use permit review. Uh, the next item is actually just about the exterior recreation area, the private playground. But yes, those concerns can definitely be addressed as part of site and building plan I review. Know you, I know you've engined, you know, you, you did your due diligence on how you want to split it. I'm just saying if, if you just split it north to south, Lot one, lot two, whichever way you had access on east and west, the buildings would face front and wherever you put the parking in. But it's yours. Um, you just have to get through conditions and restrictions on it. Make sure it, you know, the building doesn't look backwards to the rest of the development. I guess that's where I'm going. So, okay, uh, that is it. Uh, any more questions, commissioners? Okay. Um, motion then on D, please. Mark moves that the plan commission recommended the common council that the certified survey map submitted by Gary Went Bradford Real Estate Companies for the property at 150 West Forest Hill Avenue be approved with the following conditions. One, that the map is revised to contain a note 
stating that the stormwater facility benefits both lots, an agreement between the two proposed development parcels must be created and recorded for the use and maintenance of the pond. Two, that the note on sheet one is revised to state that all easements existing and proposed are shown on subsequent sheets. Three, that the trash enclosure easement is removed from sheet three. Four, that all bearings and distances are included in the legal description under the surveyor's certificate. And five, that all technical corrections, including but not limited to spelling errors, minor coordinate geometry corrections, and corrections required for compliance with the Municipal Code and Wisconsin statutes are made prior to recording. 90 seconds. Uh, roll call. Chris, you want to start us? Muzikowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Super, aye. Chandler, aye. Anna, aye. Grillo, aye. Shinsky, aye. Bark, aye. David, aye. Okay, it'll get us to 9E, uh, conditional use permit for an outdoor recreation facility, private playground on the property at 150 West Forest Hill. Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just want to reiterate again, um, under the existing code, we do not require a conditional use permit for the daycare. However, it was kind of difficult to separate the two when discussing them in the report. So the conditional use permit is still going to be just for the private playground component of the daycare facility. The extra information is for plan commission edification, kind of making a little bit more sense of what's being proposed on the site itself and giving you an idea of what may be coming down the pike for site and building plan review for those considerations. And of course, with the um, concerns regarding you know, orientation of the building, site specific planning, et cetera. So the outdoor recreation facility and private playground is on lot one of the proposed CSM, which is that Northern lot. Um, and daycare facilities, again, don't require CEPs, but this will be operated by the learning experience. And on the screen right now is a conceptual, and I wanna highlight conceptual site plan at this point. Um, it is proposed to have a 10,000 square foot single story building on lot one. It does show shared access at this point with lot two. And that was part of the access um, easement that was shared between the two lots on the CSM. Um, you can kind of ignore the trash enclosure on the east side of the property that trash enclosure easement has been removed from the CSM. Uh, the 5,000 square foot outdoor play area is on the east side. We will get to that in just a moment. But for the rest of the facility, they have a maximum capacity of 159 children that they can accommodate. That's for their state license. However, there is some information that was provided that says their anticipated average enrollment is about 80%. Um, and they are anticipating up to 25% would be part-time enrollees. The building itself and outdoor areas would be controlled, monitored, and alarmed, and up to 23 employees would be on site at any time during the hours of operation, 6.30 to 6.30, Monday through Friday. There are no weekend hours proposed at this time. So that private playground facility would be completely off limits outside of operating hours unless they decide to provide some kind of controlled access to people outside of those operating hours, which has not been presented at this point. So we are, uh, for the conditional use permit purpose, talking about the area in blue on the screen right now. That is the location of the proposed outdoor private playground. Um, really, there's not a whole lot of criteria within the code for a private playground facility. But just to give you an, uh, um, a little bit more information, um, there is minimum parking requirements in the code when it comes to an outdoor recreation facility versus a private playground. The outdoor recreation facility is not assuming that this is going to be just a facility that caters to children who cannot drive. So under that, the minimum parking requirements are one stall for every three people at maximum capacity. Just doesn't apply here. It doesn't. It doesn't makes sense. The private playground uh, requirements are based on a private parking study, which we don't have, but absent that, we do have their peak times based on other locations for pickup and drop-off. With that in mind, there are peak drop-off and pickup times that are calling for about 22 to 23 vehicles at a time. And if they're looking for up to 23 employees to be on site at any time, one could make an argument that they would need at least 46 parking stalls 
since we do not know, and this is not part of site plan review tonight because this is just the conditional use permit, but this is just kind of food for thought for what's coming down after this, this review. Um, it, there may be, need to be some changes to that site plan based on what the requirements are going to be. We don't know what lot two is going to develop with. So we can show the shared access, we can show shared parking, we can show a building configuration, but until that gets proposed, we have to consider each site on its own merits and on its own code compliance. Again, this is not site and building plan review, just something to be aware of whenever those plans are being developed. And with that in mind, we are going to see the need for site and architectural elevations to be significantly changed from what was in the concept uh, in order to be code compliant in the future. So uh, there are minimum requirements for each of the building elevations in terms of architectural materials. Uh, minimum parking requirements, again, would have to be met. Um, orientation of things and proper screening, landscaping, all of that would come at site and building plan review. And that would be required to be compliant. There are no considerations as part of this review for any variations from code. Um, so again, landscape screening would be required for the, par the parking lots, within the parking lots, the trash enclosure, wherever that may end up as part of the site plan review, those kinds of things. Really just bringing it up for, you know, again, that site plan planning, site plan planning uh, in the future. Want to remind you that the commission's initial review and recommendation, if they choose to do so, of a proposed conditional use permit is not an endorsement of any site architectural landscaping or lighting plan that may be required as part of a conditional use permit or as part of code. So with that in mind, there is a suggested motion for plan commission consideration on the screen. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Carrie, on the, the last, the, the previous slide, um, is that, that's the wrong address, isn't it? It, it is, is my apologies. Address. That is a holdover from a previous slide. And I. Okay. Yeah. Just to be clear, um, we yes. are talking about 150 West Forest Hill. Yes. Okay. Super. Um, one, a few words, sir. Anything or you want to wait on questions? Okay. I'm good. Um, Chaucey, you want to start? No questions. Thank you. Fred? No questions. Uh, no questions. Chris? I have no questions. Fred? I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Ashley? No questions. Thank you. Oh. Nothing for me. No question. I was just asking, Carrie, how is this close to 2017? <laughs> I started to Google it. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Every other slide was correct. That one was know. just a, an, a typo. I'm I'm over from a previous time. slide. So I don't have any reservation. You know, I mean, it's a daycare. We definitely need the children to get out there and do what children do, and we need it. So um, I'm good with it. But as I think Carrie laid it out pretty well, there's some, some site issues that they'll work through with staff. I'm confident. So, okay. I do have one question. Yeah. Right. Where, when do we address the mayor's concern about the it's site and building plan review. Site so, okay. Uh, the applicant, a lot of what was said tonight is really intended for the applicant to take that into consideration when creating the plans for the next step. So, it's really kind of a preview and a little bit of a guide uh, for developing those plans. And even though it's not pertinent to the, the conditional use permit itself, I'm sure it's helpful. But yes, that'll be for site. site and building plan review. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we get a motion on either? And I move that the plan commission recommends that the common council approve the conditional use permit, allowing an outdoor recreation facility slash plague playground on a portion of the property at 150 West Forest Hill Avenue, lot one of CSM to be recorded after a public hearing and subject to condition and restriction that will be prepared for the plan commission's review at the next meeting, September 27th, 2022. Mr. Kowski, a second. Uh, roll call beginning with Don. Hold on, aye. Super aye. Chandler, aye. Anna, aye. Rillo, aye. Cynthia, aye. Lorik, aye. David, aye. Mr. Kowski, aye. 
Right. Thank you for your patience. It was a little long. No, thank you. As a as an architect and actually a plan commissioner in Glenview for a dozen years, it was enlightening to see your first presentation. Yeah, and what a wonderful uh, project for the community. Well, it was really exciting, and and they came up with some really uh, creative ideas too. And if you, yeah, I know you haven't been down there, but it's a challenging site. Yeah. So. Well, in, in Glenview, when I, when I started with the plan commission, we were redeveloping the Glenview Naval Air Station, twelve hundred acres in the middle of Glenview. So it was an important issue. Very item. much. Yeah. Yeah. Fun projects when you get them. Challenging, yeah, but fun. So. But, Great. Thank you all for your service. Thank you. All right, see. Uh, before I call for adjournment, just a couple of announcements. Uh, Dawn, you're getting into the fall season here. You want to plug the market? We are on week Take 18 of the market. Seems like just yesterday. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's going to be mm -hmm. fall. There's pumpkins available. Uh, we are on the, I believe, yeah, seven left. Okay. Uh, one more exciting thing coming up here, uh, just a couple of short weeks away, is our cafe, our culture, art, food, and entertainment. It's a celebration of culture here in Oak Creek. So it'll be right here in Drexeltown Square, following up directly after the farmer's market, October 1st. So there'll be cultural exhibits, art exhibits, ethnic food tasting, and ethnic entertainment going on. If you've never been to it, come check it out. Uh, goes from one to six at Drexeltown Square. So uh, I passed you all flyers. Um, if you've never been there, please take a look. It's it's really uh, unique, and uh, we've had great success with it in the past. So I hope to see you all there. Um, with that, we'll look to adjourn. Carilla moves to adjourn at eight twenty-three. Two per seconds. Uh, roll call beginning with Fred. Super I. Jan Bari and I. Shinsky, I. Bork, I. David, I. Who's the coast? Yeah. Hold on, I. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>